the Gospel according to St. Luke. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were being drawn to Jesus to listen to him, and the scribes and Pharisees were upset. They said, he welcomes tax collectors and sinners, and he even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. He said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger son asked for his inheritance. And so the man divided his inheritance and gave the younger son his inheritance. And the young man went off to a far country, and there he squandered it all in dissolute living. And when he had burned through all his money, a severe famine fell on that land, and this young man was in need. And so he hired himself out to a local farmer, And he was so hungry that he would have eaten the corn cobs that he fed to the pigs, but no one gave him anything. Well, that brought him to his senses. And he said to himself, My father's hired hands are doing better than me. They get three meals a day. I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I don't deserve to be your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. And so he got up. And he headed home. And when he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and had compassion on him. And he ran to greet him and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the young man said, Father, I've sinned against God and against you. I don't deserve to be your son. Treat me as a hired hand. But the father would not hear of it. He said to the servants, Go get the family robe and the family ring and sandals. And kill the fatted calf, because this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost, and he's found. And they began to celebrate. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of my ordination into pastoral ministry. June 17, 1984, I was ordained at Lutheran Church of the Master in Edina into Warden Sacrament Ministry in the Lutheran Church. <clears throat> and it may come as no surprise to, to know that reaching that anniversary has prompted me to look back on these past 40 years And I can say that it has been filled with far more blessings than burdens. I can say with King David in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. And it's also kind of forced me to try and summarize and to figure out what has been at the heart of my ministry for these 40 years. What has been the essence? What has mattered the most? And probably the person who captured it best um, was... Father Joseph Warlow, in something he said to Tony Hendra. Tony Hendra uh, wrote a spiritual memoir called Father Joe, the Man Who Saved My Soul. He did that back in 2005. And it's the story of his relationship to um, Father Joseph Warlow. Um, Father Joe was a uh, Benedictine monk at Core Abbey, on the Isle of Wight, just off the southern coast of England. But nobody called him Dom Joseph. Everybody knew him simply as Father Joe. Well, <clears throat> Tony met him first when Tony was 14 years old, and he was taken to Cor Abbey. And he was taken because he was in trouble. He had a romantic relationship with Lily, who was a 20-something young woman who was married, and they had a romantic relationship. And Lily's husband caught the two of them kissing each other. And so because her husband knew Father Joe, he dragged Tony off to Cor Abbey. Tony was terrified the whole way there. He was afraid he would be condemned, and if not that, at least consigned to hundreds of years in purgatory. And he was terrified of the abbey, terrified of what awaited him. But when he got there, he was taken up to a second-floor room, small room, simple room, and waited there for a while, and finally Father Joe entered the room. And he didn't look at all terrifying. As you can see, he was 
a man with a receding hairline, wire-rimmed glasses, large nose, large ears, and a very gentle face. He was thin, almost frail. And he sat down, and Tony knelt before him like he always did for confession. And Father Joe lifted him up and had him sit on the stool next to him. And Father Joe closed his eyes, paused a moment, and then said, Tony, dear, tell me everything. And so for the next 45 minutes, Tony did. He told Father Joe everything about his relationship to Lily. And when he was done, Father Joe paused for a moment, and then he said, Tony, dear, you haven't done anything wrong. The love of God brought you here before you could do any real damage. You have committed the sin of selfishness. Tony was shocked. No rebuke, no condemnation, no judgment. And then Father Joe went on and he said, but you won't see Lily for a while, will you? At least not alone. That wouldn't be fair to her, would it? And for the first time, Tony thought about Lily trapped in an unhappy marriage. Father Joe gave Tony the absolution, and then Tony asked, well, what about penance? And Father Joe said, oh, I think you've probably done a lot of penance already, haven't you? Waves of relief and peace just flooded Tony, and now he wanted Father Joe to stay, this man who he had been so terrified of. He wanted him to stay, and Tony wanted to tell him everything about his life. And so he asked Father Joe to stay, but Father Joe said he had to leave, and so he hugged Tony, blessed him, and walked out the door. And Tony sat there in peace and in silence. Well, Tony was so taken by Father Joe, so graced, that he decided he wanted to become a Benedictine monk and live and spend his life at Quor Abbey. And so all through his high school years, he thought of himself as a monk in training. He read everything he could by the Benedictines. He read the rule of St. Benedict. He tried to live by that rule. He prayed the Benedictine hours of prayer. He made their motto, Ore et Labore, prayer and work his own personal motto. And in the summer, he would go to Core Abbey and work there, and there was no place in the world that he would rather be. Well, when he was a senior in high school, he took college entrance exams, and much to his surprise, he won a full-ride scholarship to Cambridge. But he didn't want to go to Cambridge. He wanted to go to Core and enter the novitiate. But Father Joe insisted that he go to Cambridge, and so he did. And he thought to himself that he would get his degree at Cambridge, and then he'd go to Core and begin his life as a monk. Well, while he was at Cambridge that first year, he lived like a monk. He wore a cassock. He prayed the hours, read the rule of St. Benedict, tried to live by it. But one evening in the fall, in his second year, he went to a comedy review called Beyond the Fringe. And it was done by four of his fellow students there at Cambridge, uh, including Dudley Moore. And the night was electric. It was magical. He laughed uproariously. And he wrote later, he said, I went into that theater a monk and I left a satirist. Save the world by prayer? I don't think so. I was going to save the world by laughter. And so he began to perform comedy routines and sketches. He moved to America, did more stand-up, and then he got his big break when he became the managing editor for National Lampoon. And later he became the editor of Spy Magazine, and he wrote plays and uh, sketches and movies. And his professional life was going great, but his personal life was a wreck. He was doing drugs, drinking way too much alcohol, He married uh, Judy, his uh, girlfriend from Cambridge, uh, whom he had gotten pregnant, and they had two children and were eventually married 20 years and then divorced. He slept around a lot. There were lots of laughs, but not much joy. And in the process, 
Tony lost his faith. But even though he had no faith, every so often he'd go back to core to talk to Father Joe. He found himself irresistibly drawn to Father Joe. And then when he was in his mid-50s and at the lowest point of his life, he went to core again to talk to Father Joe. And they had a long conversation that day. And it's in that conversation that Tony figured out what was tearing him up inside. And this is what he said to Father Joe. He said, I seem incapable of love, Father Joe. Utterly incapable of feeling it, of thinking it, of even wanting it. No, that's not true. I want love terribly, but it won't come. Father Joe listened to Tony And then he paused and he opened his eyes, looked at Tony, and he said, Tony, dear, you will only be able to love when you understand how much you are loved. You are loved, dear, with a limitless, fathomless, all-embracing love. That conversation was a turning point for Tony. He began to believe again, not just in God, but to believe that he was still God's beloved child. And he discovered that his calling in life was not to be a saint or a monk, but to be the most loving father and husband that he could be. And he realized that the only way he could be that was to take to heart Father Joe's words. Tony, dear, the only way you will able, be able to love is to understand how much you are loved. You are loved with a limitless, fathomless, all-embracing love. So Tony quit the drinking, got rid of the drugs, stopped sleeping around. He married his girlfriend at the time, Carla, and they remained married for the rest of his life. And they had two sons, And 10 years later, after that conversation with Father Joe, Tony went to Cor Abbey again, but this time with his two young sons, because he had heard that Father Joe had cancer and all the treatments had been exhausted and that there was nothing more to be done. And he wanted to visit Father Joe one more time, and he wanted his sons to meet the man who had saved their father's soul. You are loved, Tony dear, with a limitless, fathomless, all-embracing love. And you will only be able to love when you understand how much you are loved. Those words sum up my ministry better than any other. That's what I have tried to do these past 40 years, is to help you know how deeply and dearly you are loved. Because the more deeply we know that, the more deeply we are able to love. I end almost every service with these words. Go in peace. You are God's beloved. And now you know why. You know why I have said that for week after week for all these years. It's for this reason. That the more deeply you know you are loved, the more fully you will able to be loved. And when you leave the service every week, I want you to take that with you so that no matter what the week brings, whether it's joy or sorrow, whether it's blessings or burdens, whether it's filled with bright days or dark days, no matter what the week brings, you know deep in your heart, down in your bones, that you are a beloved child of God and that nothing can change God's love for you. We are loved with that limitless, fathomless, all-embracing love. So go in peace, today and every day, because you are God's beloved. Amen.
Our song of the day is Although I Speak. I invite you to stand as you're able. <clears throat> 